who have been establishing what wealth is, what true biblical wealth is. It's the presence of Holy Spirit. And, uh, and having the glory of God restored. And then we've gone into how poverty comes into the life of a believer. And now it's time to move into the next phase of how to access the wealth of the kingdom. And so I don't really, you know, obviously have time to go over uh, months worth or weeks worth of teaching. So we've got them on the website, but I like to lay the foundation that all wealth is to further the kingdom of God and to destroy the works of the devil. But also, God wants us to enjoy the things that he blesses us with and to enjoy life. And um, Elizabeth, can you uh, put this up? On the uh, flip chip. And I think it's ready to go live when you do that thing and you can hit the button. And so the first step, and I mentioned it last, well, two weeks ago, that uh, giving, tithes and offerings are an important foundation. We're, we're going to look at in depth. God showed me some things I've never seen before. And then the other thing is how to harvest. How do you harvest wealth? Um, that's where a lot of Christians stumble. They're not quite sure how that works, and we're, we're going to look at that. And then I can't even remember the third one. But I guarantee you that when it's time to study that third one, I will be ready. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but um, what I want to look at is how, how many of you know how many types of giving there is? You know, I feel like the, com the comedian that's in front of me. <laughs> there's four. There's, well, yeah, there's four. One um, kind of co-mingles with another one, which we're going to get into uh, in part two of this. But I want to give you the four, okay, so that you can write them down. And then I'm going to lay a foundation beginning in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 10. So if you want to turn there, that's where we're going to start. But there are four types of giving. The first one is tithe. The second one is offerings. The third is uh, first fruits, which I thought tithing was first fruits, and first fruits was tithing, but I found out that is not the case. And then giving to the poor, or what we call alms. And, uh, and so let's uh, look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, through verses 15. Now, what we're going to read is the pre-fall state of mankind. So this is before poverty entered, this is before sickness entered, and this is before death entered. So in chapter 10, it says, A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted, and it became four river heads. Two of those rivers are still here today. Okay? The name of the first one was, and I'm going to totally, like, botch it. Um... Pison, maybe? Can we just go with Pison? Does that sound good? I would have said Pishon. Pishon. Okay, mine doesn't have the H, so we'll do Pishon. That sounds better. Because Pisson, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just can't you know, do it, right? <laughs> so, that's just not going to work. <laughs> that is which consumes the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is also precious stones and onyx stones. And the name of the second river, is it Gishon in yours or Gihon? With the H. Okay. And uh, that is what encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is uh, Hadekel. What do you have? Yeah. Okay. And that is which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So we still have the Euphrates here. And one of these rivers was later named uh, Tigris. So the Tigris and the Euphrates are still in existence. And the Euphrates, just a little side note, the Euphrates will play a huge role in the end of the age, if you're curious. That's in Revelation. It's one of the boundaries, I believe, that they're going to claim. And it'll dry up. 
and they'll cross over. One of the largest armies the world has seen. And if I'm not mistaken, it might have been the Euphrates that King Cyrus uh, had them block uh, by Babylon, and then they were able to go under the walls. Or it was Tigris. Was it the Tigris? Mm -hmm. Anyway, those two rivers are very important. Is that where the demons come out of too? Is it? it might be. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, the word Eden means pleasure, it means delicate, and it means delight. And over in uh, Ezekiel chapter, I believe, 47, let me show you, because if you think of the Garden of Eden, it was like paradise on the earth. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, scholars believe that it was in Africa. But that's the cradle of civilization is Africa. And Adam and Eve were the ones that were given dominion over the earth and to multiply all that. But their special area or their home base was the garden. And like I've talked about before, we don't know how long they multiplied in number before the fall. We do know that there was multiplication going on because when Cain got his sentence, and had to leave his parents because he was now a fugitive or a vagabond, he found a people to join himself with, and they began to have a, a, you know, a family line, which if you study that line has been against the people of God the whole Bible. Okay, So we know that there was a multiplication, but Eden is representative of the paradise of God, the presence of God, which I'm going to show you in Scripture in a second. But the river... Uh, is a picture of one that flows right now out of the throne room. And it's called the river of life. And in Ezekiel 47, verse 1, uh, Ezekiel's in a vision. It says, Afterward he brought me again to the door of the house, or the temple, and behold, rivers issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the temple at the south side of the altar. So, whatever God does on earth is mirroring what is in heaven. Okay? So, when he gave the tabernacle to Moses, Moses received a pattern of how to build it. And if you want to know why he does that, he does it so that he has a suitable place for his presence. If you say that, all of it has to do with him being with us, which is incredible. Even after the fall, he wanted to be with us, so he created tabernacles. Now, in Psalm 1611, it says, I don't want to quote it because I don't want to get it wrong. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So again, the garden is the picture of the presence of God. And with the presence of God comes beauty and excellence and pleasures. He's not the dad that um, made a bunch of kids and then left them on their own or doesn't want them to have good things to enjoy. He's a father that wants to pour out onto his children extravagant goodness. And so for a lot of people, if you've been raised like in a strict home or if you've been fatherless or motherless, it's sometimes hard to retrain your mind to understand how good God is. Are y'all in agreement with me? Okay. And the root word of pleasant here in the definition of Eden means soft or to live voluptuously. I'm like, voluptuously? <laughs> I mean, to me, that's, you know... You know. <laughs> so I'm like, voluptuous? Well, okay, what the heck is that? So I looked it up. It means full of, characterized by, or ministering to indulgence and luxury, pleasure, and enjoyment of the senses. Hmm. Now see, if you are religious in your heart, or if you're having a rough time understanding that that's how God is, you might be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean he created the garden? For Adam and Eve to be surrounded with <coughs> voluptuous things that appeal to their taste and their sight and their hearing and their skin. 
Have any of you ever worn a high-end suit or dress? Anybody? Okay. All right. So it feels totally different from Walmart's clothes, huh? <laughs> but whenever Chrissy had her um, grand opening, you know, it wasn't a high-end dress. It was like one of those rent the runway or whatever dresses, you know? Anyway, I put that on, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, I can handle this, you know? And then Mike, when we graduated, he, uh, we got him a suit, because he didn't want a suit. We got him a suit, and I mean, just your whole demeanor, your, just the whole thing shifts, and you just feel good, and the materials are pleasant. That's what he's talking about, that he created such beautiful things to surround them with. Why? Because he loved them. There was no reason except that he wanted to pour out his goodness and he wanted to give them a picture of what it looks like to be a child of God. And here's the thing, and I recommend this, and one day me and Mike, we've talked about doing this. The enemy has convinced us that poverty or lack is normal, but it's not. And if he can keep us convinced that it is, we'll stay there. But all of us have a dissatisfaction in not having all of our bills paid. All of us have a dissatisfaction in not being able to buy our children clothes or to buy ourselves clothes and then to take it even a step further by the clothes we'd actually like to buy. Am I talking to anybody here? Okay, so what you have to do is you have to begin to experience and break out of that mindset and so one of the things we talked about that we want to do is one day we want to rent, uh, even if it's a, a night uh, at a five-star hotel. And we want to eat at a five-star restaurant. Because we want a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like. Because I guarantee you the five-star hotel and the five-star restaurant doesn't compare at all to what is in store for us. And you might be like, well, why is that necessary? Why are you talking about that? Because we are called to wealth for one purpose, and that's to fund the kingdom and destroy the works of the devil. And if God cannot get that picture in our minds, we're not going to be able to live to that reality. Because as a man thinks, sees, and perceives in his heart, so is he. And so even like if you third world countries or, or you know, countries that are not as blessed as ours, there is a level of wealth. It's relative. So each one of us has to ask God, what does wealth look like in our life? And you have to begin to get that picture when you don't have it yet. Because God has created the body to walk toward what it sees and believes, not what to toward what it does not see and believe. You understand that, right? The subconscious will only do what it's told. And so God put this extravagant, voluptuous enjoyment of the senses for his two kids. And what it did is it created in their heart satisfaction. It created in their heart contentment. This is the epitome of wealth. The Garden of Eden is the epitome of wealth. So get this picture. You've got rivers all through it. Uh, a mist from the ground is watering everything. There's gold. There's precious jewels before anybody even knew what to do with them. God put all of that in the earth for us. And I have been hearing repeatedly that there is a transfer of wealth, transfer of wealth, transfer of wealth coming. Let me read you something that God showed me the other day in my uh, uh, prayer meditation, or scripture meditation, this blew me away. It's Ecclesiastes 2.26, and I believe it's amplified, but I'm not sure. But listen to this. To the person who pleases him, and how do we please him? Faith. Faith. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Now, you might want to write those down, because I'm about to show you something. But to the sinner, the one that does not know God, he gives the work of gathering and heaping up that he may give to the one who pleases him. What? Okay, now, that's the promised land. 
What did he tell them? I'm going to send you into a land flowing with milk and honey. The grapes were so huge, it took two men carrying a cluster on a pole in the land of Canaan. There were houses already built, crops already planted, vineyards already growing, and he handed that land over to them. So for over 400 and something years, sinners cultivated that land, built to that land, did everything that you know we would normally have to do, and then God handed it over, but what did they have to do to get it? Step out in faith. Faith, and what else? And action. Action, and what else? <laughs> Warfare. No. Well, that's the action I was thinking about. Yeah. yeah. So, before they entered the promised land, they were slaves. Right? In Egypt. Okay, so they leave Egypt with a slave mentality. Have you ever wondered why God did not take them straight to the land of Canaan, but instead he took them on this circuitous, is that how you say it? I'm trying to use words, I think, too big. Kind of, you know, like all over, wandering around path. <laughs> so he takes them on this wandering around path. After, if you read, I think it's in Exodus chapter 14 or 15, God purposely led them to the Red Sea. I thought it was because they were complaining all the time. No. The, the, the place he led them was on purpose. Well, yeah, but I mean, when they were out there wandering around. No, not yet. And you, you're getting ahead of me. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, he takes them to the Red Sea, and the army is behind them. Why do you think he led them to a place where their enemies are behind them and able to pursue them? To show his power, basically. And for them to take control of their destiny. Remember, they're all, oh, he brought us out here to kill us. <laughs> okay, number one, they did not know God's character. God just destroyed the biggest nation, the superpower at the time, and they still do not understand that the God that is for them is going to take care of them all the way through. They get to the Red Sea and they start complaining. So let me tell you something. If you start complaining every time you hit a trial, you have a slave mentality. Okay? So they get to the Red Sea. Their enemies are behind them. Moses goes to God to say, you know, we're surrounded and everybody's upset, blah, blah. And he goes, what's it to me? What do you have in your hand? That's what, that was God's response. A staff? Use it. Because he already showed them the staff had already brought down the superpower at the time. So he's saying, take that staff and use it. What do you think I gave it to you for? Right? And so he goes and says, okay, this is what we're going to do. Now, he didn't tell them how at first. And so they get to the water. He strikes the water. They part. They walk across dry land. Now, if you've ever been part of a riverbed, you know that riverbed wherever you know, it's receding. It's not dry. You still sink in the sand, right? When you're on an ocean or whatever and the tide goes out, you still sink. Dry land. And then the Egyptians go to follow them across and the waters come over them and completely wipes out the superpowers army of that day. And do you know they have found chariots in the Red Sea? And they, they dated them. And they were back at that time. So then he takes them here and then he takes them there and then he takes them here. <laughs> Why? Because he had to get the slave mentality out of them. And the slave mentality is one of lack. So then they're thirsty. So instead of asking God for provision, and hey, you're thirsty. What do you think it's out here again to kill us? We're going to die thirst. So then Moses again goes to the Lord, and he says, well, there's a rock here, which, by the way, they have found the rock. It is a huge, huge rock. I mean, when you're Philip, you know, giving six million people something to drink, you know, you can have a little pebble right here, right? So it's this huge rock. He struck it, water gushes out. Why? Because he was testifying of Jesus Christ as the rock. Then they're hungry. Very hungry. Remember the leeks we used to have and all that you know, back in Egypt? They didn't have all that fancy food. They were slaves. So he's like, well, I'll feed you with manna. So then this substance that was called, what is it? That's what manna means. What is this? God rained down every day except for the Sabbath, 
And then what happens? I'm tired of eating this manna. It's any me, 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 me. We don't see me. So the Lord's like, all right, now he's starting to get a little annoyed. Because he's trying to get the slave mentality out of them because he knows eventually they're going to have to confront giants. It's that's the thing. You will not leave the wilderness until you quit complaining. And you will not leave the wilderness until your slave mentality is transformed into a kingly, authoritative mentality. Okay? So, what does he do? He sends them birds. He said, I'm going to send them, what was it, quail, until it's coming out of their nose. Yep. And before it eat, they were eating it raw, weren't they? Which is against the law, if I'm not mistaken. Some of them made it raw. I'd have to go back into the story. So then they, you know, they take off again, and they're, eh, 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 we're thirsty again. Okay, this time, Moses is ticked. You know, he's like, I've had it with these people. These are your people. Why did you even put me in this position? I don't want to be here. I didn't ask for the job. You found me, remember? Okay, so there's whole dialogue. So God tells him, he says, this time he says, speak to the rock. Don't strike it. Speak to the rock. Oh, I'm going to have to tell you what God showed me. I can feel the anointing on it. Uh, you think it's time to go on? Okay, one second. All right, so he says, speak to the rock. Well, the leader of God is ticked. So he's like, striking the rock twice. Water comes out. But instead of speaking to it like he was supposed to, he struck it. Why? Because frustration will keep you from your promised land. This poor, poor Moses guides him all the way through this 40-year journey and cannot go up the promised land because he struck the rock twice. He did not follow God's directions instead of speaking to the rock. Now, Jesus Christ is the rock, and Jesus Christ is the word. Okay, I was not planning on doing this. Go to Philippians, and I might even teach on it again next time. Might as well. And let me get the chapter for you. Uh, chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 10. Now, there's two <coughs> scriptures that are quoted all the time from this passage. But I'm going to show you something, and this is an important key. So if you're taking notes, you probably want to write it down. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord, this is Paul, greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, and I knew that you uh, lacked opportunity before. But I do not speak in respect of want, for I have learned that in whatsoever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Now the context is financial. Okay? So he's saying whether I have a little or whether I have a lot, I'm content. One second. I'm going to get it up here on my screen because there's a word that I need that is not in the King James. Okay. So then he says, notwithstanding you have done well that you did communicate or help in my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church supported me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, what he's saying is the only people that were partnering with him financially to provide for his needs was the Philippian church, okay? And he says, even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again for my needs. Not that I seek the gift, and that word seek is crave or require, but I desire the fruit that may abound to your account. Keep verse 17 in mind. We're going to come back to that. 
But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not everyone can stand on that scripture. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. The only people that scripture applies to are those that partner with ministries. That's offering. And we'll get to that later. But let me show you the key. Go back to verse 17. He's telling them, God is my source. I don't, I don't crave the money. I don't need the money from you. But what I do crave, what I do desire to see is the fruit of that may abound to your account. Now, two words you might want to mark. Abound and account. Now, the word abound means to have an overabundance, a surplus. Okay? That's in the Greek. So he wants them to have a surplus. Now, account. When I first saw what this Greek word was, I thought I was in the wrong place. So I clicked on, because I have a computer program, I clicked on the number again for the word account, and the same exact word came up. So then this is what I did after I saw it. What? <laughs> That's what I did, seriously, in my studies. And I kept, okay, now how is this possible? The Greek word there is logos. Now does anybody know what logos is? Come on. The word of God. The divine expression as seen in Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word is God. That is Logos. It's Jesus Christ. All right, now let's read it with that in mind. But I desire fruit that may overabound to your word. Come on, you got to get this. Speak to the rock. Speak to the word. This is what God showed me. The harvesting, the surplus that God has designed for you to receive must have a container. Are you getting it, Roberta? That container you create with your confession and your decree of the word of God. Oh, come on. God showed me, you got to get this, God showed me there are people that are not harvesting the wealth he has sent them, and they think he hasn't done it. But they are not harvesting the wealth he sent them because they don't have any baskets, because they have either not been actively speaking the word of God to create their future, or they have been speaking against the word of God, creating their future. So picture a peach orchard. And all the fruit has fallen to the ground and rotted. Now whose fault is that? Is that God's fault who sent the rain? Who allowed the trees to flourish? Or is it the person in charge of the orchard, the person in charge of their garden, that has not created the baskets to gather up the fruit? You guys should be excited. I'm really getting irritated here. Now, this is so important. Think back over the last even 24 hours. What have you been speaking out of your mouth concerning your finances? Be honest. Talk to me. <laughs> there you go. I was like, wait, I had some good things and I went, you're like, well, that one thing fell. So. The fruit will abound to your word. Now, there's sowing and there's reaping, right? If you sow corruption, if you speak idle words, if you speak negative words against what God wants to do in your life, then you will reap nothing. And what that means is the fruit that will abound at your word is negative fruit, debt, loss. Never getting ahead. Every time I get ahead, I have a bill that comes up. Every time I get ahead, 
I have to get new tires. Every time I get ahead, the water heater goes out. Every time I get a new job, some idiot starts working and gets me fired. Every time, it's like, it goes on and on and on. Every time I have a business, it goes under. Whatever it is that we're saying, so we're literally getting the result of rotten fruit in our lives. But if we would take the word that says, I am the head and not the tail. I'm the lender and not the borrower. God has designed me for a specific number of wealth or amount of wealth of which I will fund, fund kingdom projects. In fact, I have shrewdness, I have cunning, and I have joy to see those opportunities so that when the sinner is done working for me, he hands it over. It does not. Isaiah 55. What it is sent to do, it will accomplish. So guys, we are creative beings that have in us the power to either bring to ourselves sickness and poverty and broken relationships and all of that, or we have the ability to literally bring to ourselves prosperity, divine health, and unity in relationships. That's prosperity. So what are you creating? And if you're not sure, record yourself. Have a conversation with someone and record yourself because you've got to create your baskets or it has nowhere to go and it will rot. And so the Lord showed me that a lot of Christians have held a grudge against him, thinking that he has not answered their prayers, that he has not sent them wealth, when the whole time they have not been preparing their baskets for it. Does this bear witness with anybody? Okay? And so I think we all have people around us that say, oh no, but you're not facing reality. That's not yeah. what you're actually yeah. in. And they're telling you that you you can't speak what you're not actually in. You've got to speak your reality. You know what I'm saying. I do, and that's the dumbest thing to do. Um I'm, he what's God, the world here. Mm-hmm spoke the words and created mm -hmm. the earth. Can you imagine if God sat there on his throne and started pondering, you know, creating a crappy garden with a little stagnant lake and a few little trees here. <laughs> Mosquitoes and stuff. <laughs> Everything that we see today, even though it's been marred by the fall, he first thought and then he spoke. And I think that's Satan pulling that joy of that word out of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. See, here's the thing. Uh, the enemy always sends your life the mixed multitude. So the mixed multitude are what followed the Israelites throughout the wilderness. Now, we know that they had to stay in the wilderness for 40 years because they could not break out of their slave mentality. A slave mentality sees things as they are. Okay? But when you're of a different spirit, like Joshua and Caleb, they see things as they will be. Okay? And so, when, when the reason Moses, now some of you might think, well, that's kind of mean, you know, Moses wasn't able to go because he made that mistake.